Welcome, birders. This is Ed Pullen, your host on the Bird Banter Podcast, where birders talk birding. Sometimes I do a big introduction to the podcast when I have a lot to say or want to uh, cover some things that have happened in the last week, but this week I am so excited to get to our guests that I'm not going to mess around with that. Dennis Paulson is my guest this week. Dennis is one of my favorite people to read and hear. Uh, Dennis is author of several birding books, also a world-renowned dragonfly expert, author of several dragonfly books. He teaches a master birding class in Seattle and a couple of times in Tacoma, and is uh, well-renowned in all areas of nature expertise. He is super fun to talk to and listen to. I hope you enjoy the Bird Banner podcast episode number 68 with Dennis Paulson. Dennis, welcome to the Bird Banner Podcast. Thanks for taking time with me today. I'm glad to be here. I'm really glad to have you. You are one of the people I've been hoping to have on the show for the longest time, and I finally got around to asking, got my confidence up, and here we are. I've, I've just actually listened, I listened to a few of your podcasts just since we agreed to do this and enjoyed them. Yeah, I hope so. It's supposed to be fun, and and I think this will be. Dennis, you are quite an accomplished birder and accomplished naturalist in general, but everybody gets their start somewhere. Tell me about how you got interested in birding. I don't know if it was a kid or whatever. Tell me your birding story. Sure. It's a a lengthy story. I'll try to summarize it. Um, When I I lived in Chicago as a kid, actually, we moved around some, and I think it was when I was about 11 years old. well, actually, I had I had gone to the city park, Jackson Park in Chicago, and seen woodcocks. And and I, I think I must have been very interested in nature anyway, because my dad uh, was a fisherman and a hunter, and he we went we went out for picnics to the forest preserves around Chicago. So I was, saw plenty of nature, even though I lived in Chicago, and uh, and I guess I must have been interested in it at some level. Uh, when my, when I was eleven years old, my parents got divorced. Uh, My mother moved to Miami with me. My dad stayed in Chicago for a while. And so there I was kind of interested in nature, moving to Miami to an apartment that was right on the shore of Biscayne Bay. So frigate birds and pelicans and things like that flew by our window and roseate roseate spoonbills, I remember occasionally. And anyway, my mother got me a bird book, uh, Birds of North America, a big coffee table book edited by T. Gilbert Pearson. Okay. Uh, and this would have been a long, long time ago, 1949, uh, t- November 1949. And uh, I th- had this big book. And I thought, oh, wow, this is really great. You know, I can learn something about birds. And we had a, a deck outside of our apartment or some kind of thing that you could walk outside on. And there were trees around. And I saw a little bird in the trees. And I thought, oh, well, I wonder what that is. And so I went back inside, opened up my big book and page through it. Oh, it's a blue gray gnat catcher. How neat. I think I'll start a list of the birds I'm seeing. So I wrote that down on some kind of piece of paper or something, whatever. It was December something, uh, 1949, Blue Gray Nag Catcher, number one on my list. Little did I know that I would continue doing that for the rest of my life. And then I just really started uh, going out. And I actually, uh, back in those days, kids could wander around freely. I took the bus from where we lived out to some uh, city parks where there were a lot of trees and out to the shore and just started seeing bird after bird after bird and writing them down faithfully on my list after I tried to figure out what they were. I misidentified some as I think most new birders do. Uh, I didn't have any sort of mentor or any sort of anybody to, to teach me anything. I had to do it on my own. Uh, I didn't have binoculars for probably the first year and a half or almost two years uh, that I became a birder. If, if you want to say that's when I did become a birder. Uh, My father then had gotten remarried and moved to Austin, Texas, and invited me to come out there and live with them, which I did uh, pretty soon, and stayed a year in Austin, Texas, going to school there, and again, uh, never stopped looking at birds, never stopped trying to identify them. I still did not have a field guide to birds at that point. I had this big uh, T. Gilbert Pearson book, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, Then my mother moved to Los Angeles to be with her family. And I went out there and spent a summer in Los Angeles with her living at at, um, Playa del Rey, which is right on the coast with shorebirds and gulls and everything, and just totally got into birding. I mean, I was probably out walking around every single day. Uh, My mother then moved to Spokane. No, my dad picked me up there, took me to Spokane where he had relatives. So I was in Spokane, Washington for a few months. Uh, actually went out and camped at Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge with a, a friend. I finally had met a couple of young 
young kids, I guess, who I went birding with, who shared my interests. And so that was really cool. Then my mother came up and picked me up and we went back to Miami. And meanwhile, I had finally gotten Ralph Hoffman's Birds of the Pacific States. And that okay. was my wonderful field. It's still one of my very favorite bo uh, bird books of, of all time. Uh, and when I was in Spokane, this friend of mine whose name was Paul Dix, uh, he had a Peterson field guide to Eastern birds. I had Ralph Hoffman's Birds of the Pacific States. I said, Paul, you want to trade books? Because I'm going now to Miami. So he said, sure. So I finally had a, 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 a Peterson field guide. And this would have been 1951 by now. Right. The Eastern probably. Eastern. The Eastern one at that time. Yes. Yeah. And so I went back to Miami. And there I spent another 15 years. And, uh, you know, that's kind of, kind of, I guess, my birding story. Uh, I, I graduated to more uh, more sort of better ways of keeping my life list and so forth uh now i have it pretty much on a on an excel spreadsheet i have never used one of the listing programs but i just made up an excel excel spreadsheet which actually has all the regions of the world and i have a, a column for whether i have photographed the bird or not and it's just that's kind of how i've kept my my bird list over the years that works that yeah. works nice yeah i have to say i've oh you know we all have before eBird, you know, eBird. Now, those of us who eBird, it's just, it, it does it for you. It's so easy now, but have gone through various iterations of record keeping, some of them uh, pretty good and some of them not so good for me. <laughs> but sure. anyway, uh, so Dennis, that's quite a story of getting started. I mean, I don't think there are that many birders who uh, bird the Midwest, the Southeast, the California, and the Northwest, and they're just in their early days of birding. So that kind of worked years, out for, that yeah. worked out for you in a kind of different sort of way. It did. And, and again, I did not have binoculars. Yes. I really want to point that out. I, uh, I got them when I got back to Miami in 1951. Oh, my so goodness. Everything I identified had to be pretty close. And uh -huh. as I say, I, I know I misidentified some things because I looked at my life list. I said, no, I probably didn't see that at that on that date <laughs> in that place. And so yeah. I just crossed it off. Very cool. Uh, so uh, you have uh, since then gone on to extensive work in dragonflies. I know this is a birding podcast, but we're all outdoors and we see different stuff. And I have to say, I see, I call them dragonflies. I'm sure some of them are damselflies, mm -hmm. uh, but see uh, these uh, dragonflies and they're really cool and some are spectacular. How did you get so interested in dragonflies? Well, that's another story. Um, actually, I'm kind of interested in, I would say, pretty much all aspects of nature, uh, from the, from the mountaintops to the plains to underwater. I've done a lot of scuba diving and all over the world. And it's just, it just, nature just captivates me. And, and I have a, I kind of have a, I mean, I have a background as a biologist. I have a PhD in zoology and I've, and I've pretty much gone deeply into biology as a, as a subject and as a career. And so I have a background in biology, which is a pretty serious thing. And then a, this interest in nature, which, which uh, is on top of that. And so I bring, to my naturalist uh, likes and, and well feelings and attitudes, this pretty pretty good underpinning of, of technical aspects of life on Earth, and so and I really like that a lot. I like to be able to do that. So anyway, I was by the time I got to graduate school at the University of Miami, I was already a birder. I was already interested. I would, I, I kept snakes and lizards in my house. I was a, a totally gung ho herpetologist. I had already become a scuba diver and was interested in fish. I'm pretty much interested. Dragonflies were the last major group of animals that I got interested in. Uh, I, I had, I started a butterfly collection when I was a, a teenager. And then I said, no, butterflies, everybody knows about butterflies. I think I'm going to collect beetles instead. So I started collecting <laughs> beetles and I'm, I am a collector. I've been a, a museum person and a, and a collector of specimens all my adult life too. Uh, got totally into the beetles, ended up with 15 or so bo big boxes of beetle collection, which I donated to the University of Florida at some point. And when I was in graduate school, I took an entomology class. And, and well, I guess even before that, I was, I was studying fish in graduate school. I, went, I started studying a group of fish that I was very interested in. And one of my fellow graduate students was doing a study on all the animals that you find in floating mats of water hyacinth. So we would go out into canals west of Miami. This was before the alligators got really big. And we weigh down to the water and put this meter square box under a mat of water hyacinths, lift it up, cut off all the edges, take it back to the lab. And, it, and he would identify everything that was in it. One of the things that were in it, there were a lot of dragonfly larvae, which was kind of cool. So I learned you know, a lot about what we were finding. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I took an entomology class, a graduate entomology class. And the professor had us 
each of us make a collection of insects of one order. We could choose the order, whatever it is. And so I was getting a little bit interested in dragonflies at that point. So I said, hey, maybe I'll, <clears throat> maybe I'll collect dragonflies and see if I can learn something about them. Well, quickly I learned there really wasn't much literature on them at all. I had a terrible time trying to identify what the, the specimens that I had collected. Meanwhile, my fish work for my masters wasn't going very well. I was doing experiments, changing the the salinity of these little killifish, which actually live between fresh and salt water. And I was actually bringing in a bunch of them from fresh water and putting them in a salt water tank just to see, <clears throat> and they would survive fine, these mosquito fish. Okay. They, you could actually put them directly from salt water into fresh water, bang, and they actually could adapt to it. It was a wonderful thing. But meanwhile, my controls, which I kept in fresh water, were dying from some sort of fungal disease. <laughs> and I never could figure out what was going on with that. It kept deviling me the whole time I was doing the study. So about the time I was taking the entomology class, I was really getting frustrated with this fish study. And I said, I think I'm just going to totally, totally do something different. I'm really getting interested in dragonflies. I think I'm going to do a survey of the dragonflies and damselflies of Southern Florida. And that's what I ended up doing for my PhD. Very cool. And since then, that's that's been the major group of animals that I've studied and, and been interested in. I, I guess say equal to birds, I guess. Both of them are pretty much equal in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that you've published extensively on dragonflies. What books have you put out? I, I have to say I've not studied dragonflies. I did a, a pair of field guides, the, sort of the prime field guides to North American dragonflies, a Western one and an Eastern one. Okay. They're photo illustrated, published by Princeton. Um, they were actually a, a sort of, a, it was an interesting story because I had done a shorebird, a book of shorebirds of the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. uh, in, I think published in 1993. And that was, that was a labor of love. I had no publisher for it. Uh, a friend of mine, Jim Erkman, who's a really good artist and knows a lot about birds. Uh, and I decided to do a series of books on Pacific Northwest birds. Mm. Okay. So he did beautiful drawings of Grebes, loons, cormorants, and I've still got those. I need to I need to get those published somewhere because they're really nice. Uh, and we were going to do it all the way through all the birds. Well, it took us a couple of years just to get that far. And then I thought, you know, we're not going to be able to do what we want to do. These wonderful books on all the birds of the Pacific Northwest. And we we're both interested in shorebirds. We had both been in the Arctic together. Right. Uh, and so I said, let's just do shorebirds. And so he started drawing shorebirds and I started thinking, you know, learning more about them, writing about them. And so that's what came to the Pacific Northwest Shorebird book, which still probably is, is my favorite of all the books I've ever written. I have to say, I have, you know, a library full of books and I have, there are three that are just my absolute favorite bird books. And that's one of them. I, you know, the Birds in Flight one by Pete Dunn and others is one. Oh, yeah. And the other Pete Dunn book, The Essentials of something, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's a, like a, a supplement to a field guide. It gives you a, books, a page yeah. on that. Those are fabulous books. <clears throat> but I have to say, I just love that. Feel. Every spring I kind of review it. It's just a wonderful that's book. That's great. Yeah. Cause I really, I just enjoyed writing it. It was just fun to write that book. Uh, and then, and then of course I got a publisher for Seattle Audubon Society. Um, so Princeton University, the, the editor at Princeton University uh, Press, Robert Kirk, uh, contacted me at some point and said, I like your short, your Pacific Northwest Shorebird. Would you like to do one for North America? And I said, golly, yes. And they offered me some money for it, which, of course, is always that nice. That helps. And I still, I wrote that, that uh, photographic guide to North American Shorebirds. And so that was, you know, that was fun. I enjoyed that. That got published. And so at some point down the line, uh, I'll backtrack a little bit. A bunch of us got together at a dragonfly meeting in Gainesville, Florida in 1977. And five of us agreed we were going to do a dragonfly field guide to North American dragonflies. And various and sundry artists and photographers and writers were all going to get together and do this wonderful first guide ever of North American dragonflies. Well, we couldn't get a publisher for it. Mm. We could not find it. We went to all the publishers that published field guides. Eh, no, there really aren't that many people interested in dragonflies. We don't think that it'd sell. So eh, I guess we won't. So now back now back to uh, 2000 and something, mm -hmm. Robert Kurt contacts me and say, we, Princeton wants to do a series of dragonfly books. <laughs> Would you be interested in doing a dragonfly field guide? And Princeton was one of the places we had contacted in 1977 where it said, no, not a chance. Yeah. So that just shows how the interest in dragonflies had had really blossomed over over time. Yeah, thank goodness for that. Yeah. And so anyway, so I wrote first a Western and then an Eastern <clears throat> field guide to dragonflies. Very cool. And I, I really enjoyed doing those. I bet too. you did. I bet you did. Dennis, what other uh, uh, interests have you uh, come across? I know that uh, birding is a huge interest. You've traveled a lot too. Where do you like to go? 
Well, I've traveled to all the continents. Uh, I think my favorite still is probably Australia. Really? Uh, I've been to Australia five times and I would, I would go there to live in just in a second. I really love Australia. I love the people are really nice. The country is fascinating. It's so much lower population density than in the United States. Uh, even though it's kind of a conservative government, it's, you know, it's nothing like as bad as what we have here in the U.S., as, as we all know. Uh, and, and they've handled their COVID thing pretty well, not perfectly, but so much better than we're handling it. It's hard to be it's worse just, than what we've done, yes. Yeah, and it's just, a, it's just a delightful place to go. You know, they've had big fires there. They've got problems with drought and fires, but nonetheless, I, the last time I was there was just a year and a half ago. So it's, uh, it's still my favorite, but I've traveled a huge amount in the, in the New World Tropics. Uh, I've written about dragonflies in the New World Tropics, and I've, I've traveled pretty much all over Central Mexico, Central and South America, and I like that a lot as well. Very cool. Did you get to travel a lot during summers? I know you, were a prof a, you worked at UPS, I think, as a teacher and a curator of the museum. That's uh, right. I, I was, yeah, I worked there I, for 15 years. Uh, well, was it 15? yeah, about 15 years. Yeah. And I retired uh, in 2004 from being the director of the Slater Museum of Natural History at UPS. And at the same time, I was teaching in the biology department all that time. Right. I taught vertebrate zoology and I taught evolution. And it was, I loved I loved being there. And I since I retired in 2004, uh, Peter Wimberger, who took my place as a director, right. uh, offered me a, a, you know, a part time position. So I actually was going down there one day a week for many years after I retired and getting paid by the university. It was a, a dream job because I really loved the museum. I loved working with students. And now, thanks to COVID, I haven't been there since early March. I, I remember when I did my episode with Peter, uh, you wandered through. I went in and sat with uh, his uh, Peter and his dog in the museum. We did an episode for the podcast, and you wandered by right in the middle of the podcast. I was like, whoo, mm -hmm. we should just have Dennis sit down with us. <laughs> Yeah. The museum is wonderful. You have done some extended wing stuff there. Tell me about that. Well, uh, I when I was at the University of Washington, I actually had, was on the faculty of the University of Washington for five years. I did not get tenure. Uh, the department chairman didn't particularly think I was worthy of much. In part, it was because that was during the Vietnam War, and I was very, very liberal and, and radical, if, if anything, mm -hmm. like some other faculty were. And he was very, very conservative, so we didn't really get along too well. And anyway, he just, he just, we, I didn't get tenure there, so that was fine. And so I was doing other things for a while. But one of the one of the perks for having been there is that I got an offer of an office at the Burke Museum. So a, a uh, Melville Hatch, who was an entomologist who had worked there, had just retired. His office was open. They said, "Hey, you know, if you want," and I knew I knew people at the museum by that time. They said, "Hey, if you want an office and you continue some of your work, you know, you could do that." So I actually worked at the Burke Museum for uh, around 15 years. I was an affiliate curator. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so I've just, you know, pretty much stayed with museums all the time. So anyway, on uh, Sievert Rower, who was a bird curator at the time, went on sabbatical for a year. He left the museum. And so he appointed me as sort of his replacement as a bird curator for the year that he was gone. And for some reason, I can't remember exactly why now, I said, you know, it's really nice to have open, to have wings of birds to look at for artists, for biologists, for people who study mold. And so we started pinning out wings at the Burke Museum. Uh, and, and that was the first, the first I knew of where that was actually being done. Uh, and so we did it a lot there. And then when I, when I went to the Slater Museum after that, we, of course, we continued doing it there. The Burke Museum now has the biggest collection of extended wings in the world. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, tens of thousands of them from all the collecting they've done all over the world. Slater Museum has a very large collection of wings uh, as well. And uh, both of them are, are sort of well known as sources for artists. And we, unlike the Burke Museum, the Slater Museum, of course, has put its wing collection online or at least yes. representatives of it. Yes. I... So, and this is the only such thing like that. The only place you can go online and find lots and lots and lots of photos of the upper and lower surface of extended wings of many, many species of birds. Yeah, when you visit the the Slater, uh, if, if you get a chance, uh, you know, and you get to look at those, you realize how big these birds can be and how yeah. little, but, uh, you know, like an extended wing of a trumpeter swan. Oh, my goodness. You know, no golden yeah. eagle and bald yeah. eagle are just, it's like, oh, you know, they're big up in yeah, the sky, yeah. but you don't realize how big. <laughs> uh -huh. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah, as I say, we, we get a lot of, 
of requests from artists who paint birds in flight who really, of course, nowadays there are so many, many good photos online, but there weren't, you know, for until relatively recently. Right, right. Uh, so uh, it, I talked to Peter a little bit about this, but museums continue to play an important role. I, you know, before I talked to Peter, I was like, eh, museums, you know, who goes to a museum these days? I mean, everything's online, but it's it's just museums play a key role. I, I was kind of boggled about that. Uh, how do you feel museums will function going forward? Do you think they'll evolve a lot or will they stay more or less the same? Well, I don't, I, it's a good question. I mean, they're not, they are not given the support they deserve. That's for sure. We're in, we're in a world that, uh, I don't know, organismal biology and nature itself are not as valued as they once were. And much of biology is going toward molecular biology because that's so associated with human health. And so we're not, so museums are not getting supported. They're, they're closing down their collections that are being sold or given to other museums. Uh, it's not a great time for museums, sadly. Uh, and Slater Museum is different than some in that it's got, it doesn't really have public exhibits. It's much more of a research and education museum. When Peter became the director, he, I, basically when I was a director, I was really uh, uh, interested in enhancing the collection and making sure it was in really good shape. And we actually got a couple of orphaned collections given to us by uh, Western Washington University and Walla Walla College. Uh, we got their, their entire bird collections, which are very valuable. And, and uh, so I didn't do too much outreach. We did have some open houses uh, and we had people visiting the museum a lot. We, I had local birders even coming and preparing specimens. We had some of the local Tacoma birders coming in uh, pretty much once a week and preparing skin and skeleton specimens of birds, which was you know a social thing as well as educational. Uh, and then when Peter came, he sort of downplayed that part of the museum and favored outreach. And so he immediately got a grant to do to do programs in local schools and a lot of tremendously good things. And he got a docent program started. And so a lot of museums have gone much more to that now, much more public education. Uh, but I, I think both of those are important. I think museums have to keep collecting specimens. They have to keep preserving specimen because this is a this is a resource for the future. This is a, a, something that will be of value forever as far in my in my mind. So I'm very supportive of museums and very excited about them. And, and I pretty much curated the insect collection at the Slater Museum in these years when I was only working one day a week. And we have a very, a very nice insect collection at this point. Again, useful to people trying to identify insects, trying to learn more about them. Very cool. Uh, do you know, are museums now, and, and I, I'm assuming the answer is yes to this, but museums must be collecting more uh tissue for DNA analysis and storing it on specimens now. Is that happening? Oh, oh yes, very, very much so. Again, uh, the Burke Museum, which has always uh, been a leader in, in actually collecting specimens and preserving them, I think has the biggest, one of the biggest tissue collections now, uh, many, many, ten, many tens of thousands <clears throat> of specimens. We actually, uh, we don't have a, such a collection at the Slater, but we actually save tissues from a lot of birds for the Burke Museum. Mm -hmm a lot of birds that are prepared at the Slater Museum. Okay. I uh, I yeah. thought of that when I because I just uh, listened to and you know read some about uh Dave Slager's uh crow work in the Northwest mm -hmm. and I know he traveled around to various museums in the area of interest in that uh, hybridization zone between Northwest and, and American crows and and looked right. at looked at stuff from those things and I think he used museums for a lot of that. So it it oh, remains yeah, very very much so. It remains mm -hmm. uh, very important important uh yeah yeah bird stuff and also well the whole ecologic stuff. the whole basis the basis for field guides for example there would have never been any field guides to birds if it weren't for museum specimens for sure uh, there was there was nothing nothing to replace them at that point and they're still used there's still uh, artists on uh, you know doing a field guide to some little island in the south pacific or something still has to go to a museum and just see what these birds actually look like. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dennis, do you, are there any future books in your, uh, in your thing? I, I want to put a shout out for this. Uh, I'm assuming it will be really good because your writing is great uh, for this. What's the uh, call the birds of the Washington or 
the new book. It's, it's an ABA field guide to Washington birds. Yes. I, I read Dave Iron's book for Oregon. Uh, my girlfriend now is just kind of starting to get into birding a little bit. And uh, she finds a big field guide kind of overwhelming. You know, it's just like, oh, so uh-huh. it says 800 birds in this. How do I even get started? You know? <laughs> uh, and uh, and so I, I bought Dave's uh, book of Oregon because, you know, Oregon birds and Washington birds are not that much different. Uh, yeah. And uh, and it was nicely uh it, it was a nice uh place she kind of could oh i get this yeah this makes more sense and and I, i'm sure yours will be you know, along the same track for washington probably it'll, it'll be extremely similar I, one of the things i did was decide to choose all photos different from those that are in dave's book that's good so brian small who photo, who furnished the, so many of the photos for these books the majority of them uh, i had access to his photo collection for this book and i was looking in the birds of, in the Oregon field guide constantly to make sure I chose a different photo for every bird so that if somebody wanted to buy both birds, they wouldn't have a lot of dupl- both books. They wouldn't have a lot of duplication. I feel like they're looking at the same pictures. That's nice. Yeah, That's nice. Des, I'm going to switch subjects a little. One of the ways that a lot of Washington birders get to see you these days, uh, maybe not this year, well, definitely not this year, uh, unless we do it online, uh, is at the uh, WASC conference every year. Uh, and uh, we there's a the photo quiz. Uh, I know that, that in years gone by, I don't think they still do it. Years gone by, that happened at the ABA conventions and stuff. And our photo quiz is so much fun. Uh, Dennis, you choose a bunch of photos each year and kind of it goes differently. Teams or the general uh, uh, public raise hands different ways. Uh, but uh, one year I, I got uh, lured to be on the team uh, for, I think, Pierce County or something. Uh, it might have been the one up mm-hmm. in Bellingham. I'm not sure. But uh, gosh, you do such a, a, a magic job of uh, choosing photographs that have enough information that if you know the right things, you can identify the bird. But to the to the less than... Uh, pretty astute birders like what the heck is that you must have fun with that how do you go about it i have a tremendous amount of fun and it and of course i'm working on it all the time because i i'll backtrack a little bit on that i love nature photography i think in my in my old age i mean i've done a lot of photography much of my adult life but i really once digital photography came into being which made it so much easier to work with the photos and and you didn't have to you could take all the photos you wanted and you weren't spending a lot of money by doing it. Uh, I love it. And so to me, nature photography has three distinct parts. First is going out in nature a lot to get those photos. And of course that's fun. And since my wife and I photograph everything, I mean, we're photographing birds, we're photographing earthworms, we're photographing flowers and scenery, just come back from a foreign trip with maybe 10,000 photos uh, from a day trip in Washington, even maybe with 500 photos. Sure. Uh, and and then so that's fun. Uh, it's a lot of work. And then I bring them home. I put them on the computer, and then I start choosing among them to the ones I want to process. And so I process a certain percentage of them. And I love doing that. It's you know working with the lighting and cropping exactly. and everything uh, in Photoshop. And I love doing it because I know I'm going to be able to use those. I think if I didn't use those photos, it would be ever so much less fun. But I know I'm going to be giving lectures or classes or something like that with these photos. And so I just love processing them and storing them as this processed photo. Um, when I'm doing that, I try to find photos that I can use for this thing you're talking about at the WAS meeting, which I call Stump the Chumps. And some people say, oh, no, no, it's Stump the Experts, isn't it? <laughs> so wh- whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think, oh, good, here's, a, here's a, a, a black capped chickadee that's only showing part of its back and its wing and tail. You know, can people immediately recognize a black capped chickadee, even though there's no black and white head there? And so I put that aside. And actually, right now on the computer, I have what I call a stump the chumps uh, file. Uh And so every photo like that, that I think, oh, this could be really good for that, uh, I I put in that file. And then hopefully by next year, there will be WAS meetings again. And I can can do it again with these various, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. No, no, gosh, no. I'd have have a heads up. That would not be fair. <laughs> Not that I'm much competition in that. I have to say, it's it's interesting, you know, birders that you you don't you don't recognize as being out that much sometimes or what are, are really good at that, and other people who are just really good birders are like Bruce Labar was on my team that year, and Bruce is a good birder, but boy, he was. He was not doing too well in that quiz. <laughs> <laughs> well, stump stump is the uh, operative word there, I guess. Yes. 
Yeah, that's uh, it is a fun thing. Uh, what what other uh, places do you go to talk, Dennis? I know that you're pretty much in demand on the lecture circuit. Well, I think I've probably lectured to all the Audubon societies in Western Washington at this point, and one or two in the East. Um, nature uh, garden clubs, even I, I talk. I have a lecture I've given on uh, plants and how they're used by birds, which uh, which is a lot of fun. You know, plants to plant in your yard right. if you want to attract birds, and sometimes butterflies too. Other other critters. Um, I've, I've lectured at a fair number. I think my, my, you know, my most, the most exciting thing for me is teaching the master birder class for Seattle Audubon. That was my next question. I started, cool. I started doing that in 1988. I have taught 13 of them now. I only teach them every other year now. Uh, and they're usually to about 24 people. And they are my version of an adult ornithology class. Uh, I, it's a very lengthy pro it's a very lengthy program. It's two semesters separated by a couple of months of vacation in between. So it's a fall semester and a spring semester, which go for, I think something like 30 lectures each. Wow. And I give the vast majority of those lectures, but they're twice a week actually. So for 15 weeks, and we also have guest speakers sort of that give maybe five of those each time, uh, bird people that speak on various and sundry subjects. And we have we have weekly quizzes, we have weekly homework, we have a midterm exam, we have a final exam. It's so much like a, a, a university ornithology class, and I love teaching it. And I think uh, students get really well acquainted during this because we have this it's pretty intense, a two hour lecture twice a week and field trips, very frequent field trips. <clears throat> so the students get to know each other very well. They get to know me, I get to know them. And it's just sort of like a, a happy family by the end of the class. Yeah. And, you know, people make lifetime uh, birding buddies through this class. And, and not only be among themselves, but with me as well, I would say, I think a lot of the people who I hang out with now are people who I've taught in master birder classes. That's really cool. I've, uh, you know, I, I was working for most of those years and I always thought I should try to get up to that. And I think you did one or two in Tacoma, didn't you? We had, uh, we had two in Tacoma. I taught one. And then I think Bob Sundstrom taught one. Okay. I only taught one in Tacoma, but some of the people you know and go birding with were in that class. I know they were. Yeah, I know Diane is. I'm pretty sure Diane took it, and a couple of other people mm -hmm. I know. She so did. that's very cool. Anyway, Dennis, what other topics come to the top of your mind as good things to talk about today? Oh gosh, well, uh, I I don't know how how good this is for a bird podcast, but the state of the environment. I'd love to hear your your comments. Yeah, well, I I. When I first came here, I spent a summer at Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge studying dragonflies. Beautiful. And I, later on after that, I spent a summer at the Columbia, two summers at the Columbia National Wildlife Refuge studying dragonflies. So I have a lot of experience in eastern Washington. I love eastern Washington. The Columbia Basin has lost over 90% of its habitat since I moved here 50 years ago. Wow. It has become, it has gone from a bird paradise to a bird desert. And it's still, it is a it is a sagebrush desert of sorts, but in terms of the, the what has happened to the fauna there, it's just it's a tragedy in my life. Mm. It's like a lot of your best friends have died over a period of time. Yeah, it, it makes me. I still go out there because I still you can still find avocets and burrowing owls and and the, you know all sorts of, and of course dragonflies and snakes and things that I like uh, out there. But they are so scarce. You have to go to just certain places to see them now. It's a tragedy. It's 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 what I call big pharma, F A R M A. Yes. Uh, agriculture has just completely taken over there. Not only to make to grow crops to feed Americans or Washingtonians, mm -hmm. but to export all over the world as they can. You know, sure. feed other people in the world. And I don't wish the other people in the world harm. But by feeding people in other countries, we are destroying our habit, our environment. We are. It, it's shocking. I mean, other you know examples that I've seen, and I've only been here thirty five years, uh, is the shorebirds at the uh, at Barman Basin. I mean, oh, absolutely. You know, it used to be you'd go down there and see hundreds of thousands of shorebirds, kind of routinely uh, during the peak yes. of spring mm -hmm. migration. And now, if you see ten thousand, it's a great day. Else. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's gone down probably by eighty or ninety percent. The seabirds are another thing. You know, I've been studying seabirds since I came here. Marble murrelets were common when I came to Washington. Now you're lucky if you get to see one. Uh, pretty much all the groups. The only groups that haven't declined are are Caucasus wing gulls and uh, some some birds are doing buffleheads. Surf scooters still doing pretty well. 
uh, but so many of the seabirds have, have just declined precipitously. I mean, that's what we're doing to the world, as, as you and I both know. It, it is. More people, fewer fewer wildlife. It is shocking. Uh, Dennis, uh, on that d- depressing uh, topic, uh, do, do you have, if you had uh, one or two things that uh, uh, conservation-minded people could push for, what, what would, you know, I, I mean, I, I have a, a bias. I think animal husbandry is just a gigantic uh, environmental disaster. Uh, sure. You know, we should, well, we should be vegetarians. That's that's pretty well established. I'm, I'm, I'm a vegan. I am not a vegetarian, yeah. but I eat, I eat as little meat as I as I can, which is not very much at this point. Good for you. Good for you. I've been vegan for about four or five years, and I have to say, I feel fine. And I, you know, I do it for health reasons. But you know, the biggest reason I do is this my little tiny statement for environmental uh, uh, causes. I, I really believe that uh, if we could, if we could just stop feeding people cows uh yeah, it would no, it would I, just I be such a completely. such a huge environmental change in this world anyway yeah uh, i agree and and then the other big thing we could do is vote democrat yes that would help that would help <laughs> and, and vote <laughs> just vote period vote period yeah. vote period most of most of the people we know i'm sure are democratic because they are people who love nature and the Republicans are pe- people who do not love nature as you know, not, I'm not totally prejudiced here. That's, that's just a generality. Of course. I think that's a, a uh, fair one. Boy, oh boy, what the, what the government is doing to the environment as well as everything else in this country is just so sad right now. And I, you know, who, who wants to talk about politics on a, on a bird podcast, but politics just dominate the world right now. Yeah. The, the, along with COVID-19, of course. They do. And, you know, I was so happy to hear Nate Swick uh, just, I don't know if you listen to the ABA podcast, but Nate Swick does the ABA podcast and he's mm-hmm. on a couple of recent podcasts. He's really been outspoken on his support for uh, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter and the there was a Black Birders Week here uh, a little bit ago, and he Absolutely. had guests on for that and and inclusiveness and birding. That you know, we're just we are a, a tiny, tiny, tiny microcosm of the world, uh, but uh, you know, inclusiveness and and uh, you know, doing being anti racist instead of not racist is just so important. So there's only a, only a so, little bit we can do, but if everybody does a little yeah. bit, maybe it'll make a difference. Well, be a good person. You know, to me, that's the like the bottom line, and, and understand what being a good person is, and be a good person. Uh, you know, I've I've been I've watched all this talk about the, some of the local Facebook groups not being such good people, uh, standing behind. Oh no, we don't want we don't want politics on our on our in our Facebook group, and therefore just we can't talk about these problems with with the minority birders and so forth that, that people face that we as white people just don't even understand at all. It shouldn't uh, be political. Facebook, Those shouldn't be political. Those are just kindness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. Oh yeah. Speaking of Facebook, one of the other reasons that I love the nature of photography and the working with the photograph is starting. I'm amazed to see it was back in 2011. Uh, one, a friend finally talked me into joining Facebook. I resisted it. I said, I couldn't care less about doing something like that, showing people what I had for breakfast yesterday, <laughs> you know, and I have, you know, I'm, I'm in contact with all my friends by email or phone or, what, or whatever. That's fine. But anyway, they said, well, no, you should really, you can, you know, you can just show some photos and you can just, you know, tell people what you've been doing. So I said, oh, I'll try that. Okay. So I decided, okay, I can use Facebook as a teaching tool. And that's pretty much what I've done since 2011. I, now I'm post almost every day, uh, and we take we my my wife Netta and I go out on a lot of local trips, even with COVID-19. And of course, we've been on lots and lots of foreign trips before that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I I post some photos, one or more photos, uh, with an educational uh, message pretty much every day. Very cool. How can people I, follow you on Facebook, Dennis? What what's your just is it at the, just join Facebook and look for Dennis Paul. So you're at Dennis Paulson probably or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of the, one of my pet peeves is people using fake names. Yeah. In this time of fake news, why would you, why would you, uh, people do that on eBird. They do it on uh, iNaturalist and, and all these things. And I just say, why, why don't you put your real name there? So people know who you are, but that's just my, my little thing, I guess. Yeah. Dennis. But yeah, today I posted today, uh, Netta and I went up to English Boom Camp in, on Camino Island nice. a, a week or two ago, two weeks ago, I guess, to look at Purple Martins there just to see if we can get some nice photos of Purple Martins mm-hmm. because they have boxes out there. Right. 
And uh, while we were doing that, a bald eagle caught a little starry flounder from a little shallow tide pool on the mud flats and picked it up and carried it right over our head. Mm -hmm. So I got lots and lots of photos of that bird. And so I can, you know, I can show these nice photos of this bird carrying the fish. I can tell what the fish is. And so people are just, you know, learning a little bit more by that. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that I'm blanking here. I'm going to, it's going to be a pause in the podcast, Dennis. I'm kind of on a little brain fart here. Anyway, you mentioned uh, that you've used Facebook for a lot of reasons. Uh, have you had uh, any issues? Uh, you know, some people have had, you know, like nasty stuff said to them stuff. You've been fine. Well, the only time they have that is when I post, a, I don't post political stuff. So yes, what I do is I teach about nature. Right. I have occasionally slipped and put something political in there. And too many times when I've done it, it starts a little bit of that stuff you're talking about. Yeah. And so I'm just, I'm never going to do it again. Yeah. You know, if other people want to argue politics on Facebook, let them do that, but not me. Good plan. Good plan. Uh, Dennis, do you have any big projects coming up? I know you just, you mentioned before the podcast that you're just finishing up both the Birds of Washington and the, and the Dragonflies of Costa Rica book. Oh my goodness. Talk about, mm -hmm. is, is there demand for a Dragonflies of Costa Rica book? Hey, I sure hope so, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> we um, shall see. Yeah, I, I, I actually, uh, when I first started here, the reason I came to Seattle was it was a postdoc that was offered me by Gordon Orians, who's a faculty member at the University of Washington in the zoology department. Very, a very, very good birder, by the mm -hmm. way. Uh, and I came and the postdoc was a year in Costa Rica and a year in Seattle. Oh my goodness. And so I actually uh, drove down to Costa Rica and start and worked with Gordon. He was studying red winged blackbirds in a marsh in Northwestern Costa Rica. And so I lived in Costa Rica for 14 months and I was already, and he wanted, the, the reason he wanted me is because I knew about dragonflies because red winged blackbirds eat a tremendous number of dragonflies up here in Washington. Oh, okay. And so that's why he wanted a dragonfly expert. Very cool. And so we went down and it turned out, well, the ones in Costa Rica weren't eating dragonflies. They were eating grasshoppers, but that was okay. Uh, I, you know, I helped study that. And I also had a whole 14 months to learn about the dragonflies of a wonderful a tropical country. Very cool. And so I did, I did that. And I've been back to Costa Rica five times since then. And I always thought it would be really neat to do a book on Costa Rican dragonflies. And then I met, uh, as I said, Bill Haber, uh, who lives in Monteverde there. Uh, he's my colleague who's, who's co-authoring this book. And he has a tremendous amount of information on the dragonflies there. He had, he had been scanning them, catching them, and putting them on a scanner. So he had these beautiful, beautiful images. And he did a lot of photography as well. So we talked and decided, yes, we got to do this book. And that was like you know five or six years ago. And finally, it's been written. It's been all with all the photos are obtained, et cetera. And it's going through the publication, going through the, the processing phase at the publisher. It'll be published by Zona Tropic Hall, which is a, a subsidiary of Cornell University Press. Very cool. And we are hoping that a lot of people, you know, I've, 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 had, I've actually led five dragonfly themed nature tours to Costa Rica and Panama wow. in the last 10 years. Very cool. So there were enough people at least to fill up a, a nature tour of you know, 15, 16 people uh, that many times. That's nice. My daughter lives in Costa Rica, so I uh, will be very interested oh, wow. to see this book. I'm hoping to spend some time down there as soon as I can travel. She's been there for about three years oh, and uh, uh, lives. Uh, she's very interested in permaculture and sustainable forestry and agriculture. And, and uh, so she's working on those type of things down there. So she's oh, that's great. super excited. That's great. And uh, I can't wait to get down and see the birds and maybe I'll identify a dragonfly or two. You never know. It's, it's a wonderful country. I mean, it is really a wonderful country. They don't have an army, as you probably mm -hmm. know. They're very progressive politically. They've handled COVID-19 so much better than so many other countries have. Um, I just, I can't say. At the same time, they have more land protected in reserves, a uh, higher percentage of their land protected in reserves than, than maybe any other country. They also have the highest use of pesticides per, per capita uh, of any country. They have huge pineapple farms mm -hmm. that are growing up. It was bananas yeah. before. Now it's pineapple, which I guess is more lucrative. And they've just, they just use a tremendous amount of pesticides on the pineapples, killing off everything everything around them. Yeah, so they, they definitely need environmental regulation, uh, at least as good or better than they have. Jean is working on exactly those issues. She's uh, like, uh, That's wonderful. 
sort of I, I, oh, I should, company I, called Jungle Projects that she's working with, who's oh. uh, working with uh, local local peoples to uh, grow a multi-tiered agroforestry uh, on their property. And right. So cool. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah, and I, I meant to say one more thing about the birding. The you were asking me what places I like to go and and so right. forth, and I could I could you know I could bend your ear for hours about that. But one of the places that I, the continent that I've birded the least on is Europe. Okay, you know, Europe is like too tame and too settled for me. I like to go to more exotic places, mm -hmm. but I have been there a couple times. But anyway, uh, my wife and I were going to go on our first bird, well, our second birding tour. We took a tour to the to the Galapagos years mm -hmm. ago. Our second birding tour ever was going to go to Lesbos, oh. this little island in the Eastern Mediterranean. I've heard it's which fabulous. Is famous for, yes, for spring migration. Mm -hmm. And I was looking forward to that so very much. That was going to be in April. And of course, naturally, it didn't go. Uh, and so I, it, we're scheduled for next year. But no, I don't have a huge amount of confidence that we're going to lick yeah. COVID-19 by next April. But Unless we hit the jackpot with a vaccine. I think that's a crapshoot. Yeah, that's a crapshoot. That's 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 crap yeah, uh, nobody's ever made yeah. a vaccine that fat, this fast before. That, mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. So we'll see. Yeah. So anyway, that was I was so excited about that just because there's, there's there's life birds for me on Lesbos and so many birds that we've never photo. I have a life list. My my most important life list is the number of birds is the birds that I photograph. Oh, okay, that's for sure. How, how do you keep track so of your it. photographs? I have to say, I take pictures. I'm not a photographer, but uh, just keeping track of them is just. I don't have a well, system. I, have, I had a. I have 70,000 slides and they're all in boxes, very nicely, neatly labeled. I am, you know, I am a, I'm a born museum person. I'm a born organizer mm -hmm. and data keeper and, you know, ma making everything keep, stay straight and, and available and accessible. So that's relatively easy for me, probably compared to a lot of people who don't even label their slides. All my slides are labeled uh, anyway. So when we switch to digital, then of course, then now they're all on the computer. And I have a program called Media Pro. That's a photo organizing program that I have all my photos in. I have close to two hundred thousand digital photos saved now. It's you know, like I say, this is a big thing with with me. And, and fortunately, my wife loves it too. Uh, so yeah, that's what I do. They're they're organized. I can every every photo of an organism has a scientific name as its uh, as its file name and a number. Oh, okay, it comes with a number out of the camera. And so, Turtus migratorius. One seven two three four is a robin yep. with that number, and it's the only you know it's the only photo like that. Yes, and that's that's for all. And then the, the non organisms just have the number; they don't have a, a label, but they're all in this photo organizing program with a caption, and the caption says where and when and, and who photo. Since there's two of us photographing, and right? Uh, Netta's name or my name, and so they're all basically they're all labeled. Media Pro, I've, and I can find something just in an instant. I've not heard of Media Pro. Is that a, a an affordable, easily accessible program? Or is it like super super all, high end? Yeah, all of the above, except they've discontinued. Oh, it. okay. Yeah. So it's a this is this could be one of the biggest disasters in my life if something happened, like a like on my computer that made that program inaccessible to me anymore. Yeah. Because all of my all of those two hundred thousand photos are labeled in that, and that's why I never switched to to some of the uh, so some of the programs so different programs that's why i've kept things in media pro for right. all these years because that label that i have with each photo will not transfer Ooh, ooh. so so far so good yeah i, I bet somebody could figure that out i you know uh, yeah. when we finish the company when we'll finish i'll talk to you about that yeah okay okay sure yeah good anyway dennis thanks for being on with me today it's been so much fun talking to you i really appreciate it oh. uh if people want to reach out to you obviously they can contact you on facebook i don't know how much facebook messaging you do yeah uh, no i much if people want to contact me i'd much prefer they would do it through email okay because i'm not much into facebook messaging i'll say do you that. mind sharing an email address but, uh, no it's dennis paulson d-e-n-n-i-s-p-a-u-l-s-o-n at comcast.net perfect dennis paulson at comcast.net you can get a hold of dennis if you need to it's been fun talking to you dennis thanks so much uh and uh i'll let you go thank you it's my pleasure Ed. I, again don't well that wraps up the bird banner podcast episode number 68 with dennis paulson was that fun oh my goodness dennis is such a wealth of knowledge and it's fun to talk to We've got a little politics today i don't often do that on the podcast but 
his views are not far from mine. I have to agree. Anyway, uh, it was really fun. I'll make sure I write a good blog post this week. Every week on the Bird Banner uh, website, I leave a blog post about stuff related to the episode. I'll make sure I leave links to places you can find his books uh, and other references about Dennis. Uh, also, some of the things we talked about on the episode. Uh, I'll also uh, make sure in the podcast notes I put some of the key things. Uh, so thanks for listening. And until next time, good birding, good day.